Could you mute, mute your mics if you're not, uh, not going to be speaking? You're free to begin. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. First, we have a rising report. At 7 p.m. this evening, County Council held a closed session meeting under Section 239 of the Act to receive confidential information from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network. I need a motion to approve the agenda. Councillor Richardson, Councillor Davidson, any additional items? All in favor? That's carried. Disclosure of any pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. None noted. Delegations and petitions. First, we have uh, Lisa Severson and Jason St. Pierre, or is it? Uh, anyway, Lisa Severson will lead the presentation. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Actually, I would like to introduce EORN CEO, uh, Jason St. Pierre. Jason uh, came on board with us almost a year ago. And so he will be doing the presentation to everyone tonight, uh, but I'll be here to help with any questions uh, after he makes the presentation. So nice to see everyone again. Thank, Thank you. you, Lisa. Yeah, but uh, there is an appreciation there that Lisa is the brains behind this organization, and I'm just going to be doing the speaking today, so that's a, an easy error to make there. So, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to give an update on uh, overall where the project is and the Eastern Ontario Regional Network where we're standing. And the next slide, please. I'm in. So just uh, we have a quick agenda. So uh, who we are and our core values. We'll just uh, review that with the team projects past and present, uh, as well as an overview in the technology. Um, the uh, Eastern Ontario Regional Network, our 2023 initiatives, and then there's time at the end for questions, as well as our contact information is there. Next slide, please. So who we are. Um, so the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, we are a non-for-profit organization, which is dedicated to improving the rural connectivity supporting economic growth and enhancing the quality of life for residents and businesses in Eastern Ontario. We were created by the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus in 2010 to help deliver and create innovative public-private partnerships to address the digital divide and support a stronger future for rural Eastern Ontario communities. And I will say uh, to that point there, um, the P3 model that was created through the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus and the creation of the Eastern Ontario Regional Network at the time in 2010 was a very innovative way to bring together both the provincial, the federal governments, as well as industry to try to find a, a solution to a market failure that's been going on in throughout the rural markets. We are a small team of 13 employees. And we govern everything we do through innovative solutions to regional matters by leveraging partnerships with a focus on regional orientation. We really are a, uh, an organization that is looking at the, the big picture from a regional perspective and looking at opportunities that we may see there from uh, market failure or uh, uh, ways to improve uh, the, the life in rural Ontario. Next slide, please. Uh, just our, our projects that we have ongoing. So the first one, just a, a short history of the projects. So in 2010, uh, the EOWC does create the Eastern Ontario Regional Network as the municipal non-for-profit. And our uh, original broadband project phase one is launched. And for those who may recall, uh, that would have been the, the DSL uh, twisted copper programs or wireless uh, programs we brought. And we we're looking to bring um, uh, broadband into those areas that had not been provided before. Uh, in 2014, uh, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network was able to negotiate a 10-year contract with Bell, which was uh, at that time very uh, new and uh, a different approach to looking at a bulk regional format opportunity versus a localized one. 2015, the broadband project is completed. Uh, but with that being said, we do still have uh, performance contracts that do continue until the end of next year. So even in the, uh, the, the copper world, we are still participating to ensure that we are able to connect people with uh, broadband connectivity through those markets where it is available. 2015, the Cell Gap project begins. 
Uh, and in 2000, uh, sorry, in 2020, the government support for the cell gap project is secured. So five years of uh, advocacy from the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, from the local uh, elected officials, as well as the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, and many partners to, uh, to prove that there was a gap in the coverage in Eastern Ontario and that we really needed help financially uh, to be able to close that gap. In 2021, Rogers has announced a successful bidder for the cell gap project and the contract signed. And in 2022, those first new tower was constructed and completed. Next slide, please. Uh, we've included these. There's two slides here that in, uh, often when we do these presentations, we're asked the difference between uh, a wireless or a mobile technology. Um, so with, we've got two slides here just to try to summarize that. Our project is a mobile service. We are looking to close the cell gap. That is the scope of the original program. There are a number of benefits that are, are uh, that will be available with this program, but initially or primarily our, our, our project here is to uh, close that cellular gap. So the cellular mobile services is the ability to access voice or the internet via a portable or handheld device. Users can move or be mobile and maintain a call or service as long as they have coverage from their providers. And the technologies continue to evolve in wireless and 5G equipment and is now being rolled out by the telecom. So our program is a 5G project that we are deploying for the cellular mobile networks. And a fixed wireless, um, fixed wireless technology, which is the broadband, um, Fixed wireless is an internet connection delivered via radio services to a fixed location like a home. The antenna is mounted on the exterior of the building or, or uh, residence and connected to a modem. And this type of technology can only be used from the location where the antenna and the modem are located. So it is, um, it is fixed. Next slide, please. So the phase two, this is our current project and what we're here to, to really talk to the group about today. So uh, the current cell gap project and the timelines that were are with that. So in 2014, uh, the MPs and the MPPs asked the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus to fix the gaps in the cellular networks in Eastern Ontario. Uh, it became known as they were traveling between their offices and back to their constituencies that there were uh, times where they would be disconnected or unable to stay in touch with the office. And it was creating some uh, challenges for them in their uh, busy schedules and uh, quite a bit of time spent in the communities. They're also hearing a fair amount of this probably from local uh, residents um, as they're out there. So uh, they approached the EOWC to see if there's an opportunity to use a similar model to what the Eastern Ontario Regional network had provided for the broadband project. In 2017, uh, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network submits a business plan to the federal and provincial governments to fix that gap. Um, and there's a lot of detailed analysis really looking at the market failure and the studies that were done in that to ensure that we had enough data to support uh, what we knew fundamentally were the challenges, but we had the data to support that in a business case and then a business plan to take to those governments. In 2019, the federal and provincial governments announced support for that business case. And in 2020, negotiations with the upper levels of government begin. September 2019, uh, they were completed, uh, sorry, in, completed in May of 2020. In 2020, we did launch the request for proposal. Uh, that was in April of 2020 with the RFP closing in September. And we had two candidates uh, apply to that, Rogers and Bell, both submitted bids to that project. In 2020, uh, the EORN reviews the bids and presents Rogers as our preferred proponent uh, to the board, and we began contract negotiations. 2021, it's announced that Rogers has been successful in that, and the contract is signed. And in 2022, our first towers are built. Um, but I guess one of the key pieces of slide, just just um, for reference, is the the amount of effort that it took. Six years of time of of effort and advocacy and work. Um, by the staff and by the local politicians to, to and the you know to pull the data together, the business cases to get to that point where we were able to go from an idea till a business case was uh, was launched or an RFP was launched for uh, for for bidding groups to to apply to. Next slide, please. All right, I'm not sure which is this the uh, Chris. I don't know if this is the moving slide or how oh, it is too. So why adding sites is required. So this is often when we're in the community, we're asked why we're adding these additional sites. When you're driving around, you see existing towers. Why do we need new towers? 
So when Rogers would have put in their submission to the RFP, they would have looked at Eastern Ontario from a holistic point of view and tried to, well, they would have developed the best network that could be integrated together to provide continuous service to um, the mobile customers that we're targeting. So to be able to do this for our towers to be able to hand off, there were gaps in our current network, um, so additional towers were required. But also as technology changes and we move from an LTE or a voice type service into standard definition and high definition services, the amount of data required and the coverage areas of each of those types of services decreases with the amount of volume that's required. So when we start talking about high definition uh, services, the footprint on that because of the data required is much smaller than a voice service of 15 or 20 years ago. The other challenge we're seeing, and, and we're hearing about it when we're in the communities today, the number of people who have subscribed or have joined cellular networks has increased over the time as people are ditching the landlines or traditional telephone lines and moving into more cellular-based telephones. So we are seeing an increase in the number of, of users and the volume on those, as well as the amount of usage that's going on to those towers. So to be able to create a seamless network that is able to carry those calls and reduce the amount of drop calls, additional towers are required for that, but also for those future technologies and where we see the data or the, um, the technology moving, additional capacity will be required in the network. All right, so after that big car moving across there, I'm really excited by the, the uh, animation that we're able to provide here. Uh, so our, our gap on our projects, we have a 99% target to achieve, uh, sorry, to achieve 99% coverage in Eastern Ontario where people work, live and travel. I always wanna say work, live and play uh, and travel on major roadways so that they can make and receive phone calls. We have a 95% target on those same areas where we can provide a standard definition uh, service level, which can support email, web browsing, and social media services. And we have an 85% coverage target in Eastern Ontario where we can support high definition services, uh, which would support things like video conferencing, movie streaming, and other data intensive applications. So these targets, when you look at the size of Eastern Ontario, essentially the footprint we're looking at is the equivalent of the province of Nova Scotia. And we're looking to be able to cover all of that, 99% of those territories where people work, live and travel with voice coverage. So it's uh, not a small task, but based on our propagation and our plans that we have in place, we are very confident that we will be able to meet all three of these targets. Next slide, please. The overview, so approximately 312 existing sites are being upgraded to support LTE phones as well as 5G. Uh, approximately 297 of those have been completed now, so we're making very good progress in the upgrades of the, uh, the network. We have 260 or approximately 260 new sites that are being built throughout Eastern Ontario. 13 of these sites have been completed or are now in service. We also have 73 sites where we're, we, we will, excuse me, where we will be co-locating on other service providers' towers. Uh, this would be the preference to try to co-locate uh, if, if at all possible, uh, but based on a number of challenges on the size of the equipment we're putting on, the footprint coverage, et cetera, sometimes that's not possible. Uh, but if it is possible, that's where we prefer to go. And of those, we have 28 of those sites completed. So making good progress in the co-location. We do have a contractual um, agreement with the province of Ontario to have our work completed by the end of 2025, so December 31st, 2025, and we will meet or exceed these uh, project goals. The other interesting uh, part on this, um, we do have a very uh, detailed service level agreement in place for the next five years to ensure that there's enough capacity in this network and enough scalability for future growth uh, to ensure that we do see a reduction in drop calls, and if those um, if the population increases or we start to see capacity challenges, we do have mechanisms in place where we are able to work with Rogers to try to mitigate those challenges. Next slide, please. So the benefits of the project, uh, first and foremost, we're looking to close the coverage gaps to help people stay connected throughout Eastern Ontario. 
we are looking to increase capacity. So a question that we re recently asked was uh, the move from 3G to 5G. And in looking at that, um, the 5G technology will carry 23 times more um, capacity than a 3G. So with the introduction of the 5G network, we are already seeing an increased capacity, but we're also introducing fiber backhaul, improved microwave backhauls, uh, additional radios. So uh, there will be additional capacity throughout Eastern Ontario. Improve public safety, so the 911 calls. Uh, it's a big big one for us to ensure that we've, we have proper coverage so people can make 911 calls if, if required. Improve multi, uh, municipal services, so paramedics, the public works, and we often talk to the paramedics. Our goal would be you know, with a high definition 5G connection, um, if there's a requirement, the, uh, the, you know, the paramedic in the back of the ambulance is able to, in real time, talk with the emergency room to start triaging and, and present the challenges or the injuries that may be in the back of the, the ambulance so that when they come into that emergency room, those doctors are fully prepared of the situation and what might be going on and have real time video discussions on, um, on an ongoing transportation uh, timeline. Uh, we are looking to improve economic development opportunities and tourism experiences. Uh, a lot of our rural territories in Eastern Ontario, tourism is a, one of our, our big uh, economic drivers. And we have people coming out of the urban areas who are looking for the same type of services as they get in downtown Toronto when they come out to uh, Cloyne or, or into Lennox and Addington. So they want to be able to stay connected and ensure that they're able to. Uh, so we're looking to ensure that they're able to do so. These new towers will also allow for future deployment of fixed wireless and new technologies to roll out. So we're talking 5G today, uh, but in some areas they're already uh, deploying a 5G plus platform that allows for more data throughput uh, than what was initially thought when we started this project. So the technology is evolving quickly, but the towers and the structures that we're building are going to be able to support those future technologies as well. Next slide, please. So the financial, the funding details, so over 300, there's over a $300 million investment in Eastern Ontario before in-kind contribution and, and community benefits. So as we said, we have our partners in this. So the government of Ontario has, uh, has contributed $71 million to our project. The federal government of Canada has contributed the equivalent, about $71 million as well. The EOWC, as well as the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus have contributed just over $10 million. And Rogers has made a minimum investment of $150 million in network enhancements and growth throughout Eastern Ontario. So it's a, a very, very large investment in infrastructure throughout Eastern Ontario. For Lennox and Addington, uh, there was a contribution made of $420,389. With uh, that and what we see for the number of towers and investment to be made, we are estimating a, and this is a very basic ROI calculation that has been done. Uh, we will be looking to do a more in-depth one upon the completion of the project. But right now we are looking at an, a return on investment of 20 to one to 50 to one. Um, depending how things go in the final uh, project. So it's a healthy return on investment when we look at the amount of infrastructure that's being introduced into Lennox and Addington. Next slide, please. So the details, so if we look across the piece, uh, tower upgrades, so regionally, we are going to be looking at 312 towers to be upgraded, 297 of those have been completed in Lennox, Lennox and Addington County. We have 13 planned and all 13 of those have been completed. So good news story there that we've, uh, we have been able to complete those. New builds, we have 260 towers across Eastern Ontario that we are looking to build. And these are brand new footprinted towers. 13 of those have been completed. We have 12 that are proposed or planned for Lennox and Addington. Uh, to date, we don't have any completed, but we are, uh, we are looking to get some of those finished in the very near future. On the co-locations, we have 74 sites that are located across Eastern Ontario where we are looking to co-locate. 28 of those have been completed to date. In Lennox and Addington, we have two that are planned for co-location. To date, we don't have any finished, but again, those are, those are in scope to be done in the very near future. The big one for us is on the land use authority. So across uh, Eastern Ontario, anytime that we are placing or breaking ground to put up a new structure, we do require the land use uh, authority process to be followed by the local municipalities. We have 260 of those that are required. To date, we have 159 of those completed across Eastern Ontario. 
And in Lennox and Addington, we have 12 that are, are uh, to be completed, and to date we have nine completed. So we would like to thank the staff from Lennox and Addington uh, for working with the Eastern Ontario Regional Network as well as our partner Rogers and be able to complete these. We had some very interesting discussions around the dark sky portion of the uh, of the county when we were looking to um, to put a tower up there. There's a lot of healthy discussion back and forth to ensure that there was no uh, visible impacts to that area. Um, and it was uh, it was an interesting discussion to be part of. So we really appreciate the effort of the staff uh, from Lennox and Addington and what they've been able to do and what they've been able to bring to the project to ensure and share with us some of the concerns or identifiable issues that we may foresee. Excellent. So steps to construction, we put this in here now just um, you know, from the time that we start the process till the time it ends can take anywhere between 18 to 24 months. So this sort of breaks it down a little bit uh, for us. So the first step to any of these constructions is to find a property that meets the needs of the network. And this is this is really done based on Roger's propagation of where they feel or where they require those towers to be placed throughout the Eastern Ontario. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the towers are in a lot of ways interconnected. So we wanna ensure that that network that's being built is able to work properly and be able to serve as many of the residents and businesses uh, within Eastern Ontario as possible. Finding a property uh, is probably not just the first step, but probably the most difficult part of this process. Um, as the typical areas where we're looking at, we have about a two kilometer radius that we would look at um, with some of our agreements with uh, the province and with the federal government. We do not or are, un are unable to go on crown land. Uh, due to the size of the property that's required, uh, it can become very restricting on the number of available properties that would meet the requirement for what we're looking to do. Once we found the property though, the uh, negotiations between Rogers in this case, or one of their, uh, their team members and property owners takes place uh, to try to find a location that uh, is willing to host a tower and uh, meets the needs of the, of the network. Once we found this, a lease is negotiated between Rogers and the landowner. Once we have a signed lease, we do conduct archaeological assessments. Wow. So at stage one and a stage two assessment on all of the sites where we are building new towers, as well as natural heritage assessments on all the proposed sites. So for Eastern Ontario, we're looking at 260 archaeological assessments, as well as 260 natural heritage assessments uh, for this project. Once we've, uh, we've We've reviewed that and we're comfortable with that. We follow the land use authority process with the municipalities to ensure that um, that process and policies are followed properly. Once we have the proper approvals there, we would notify the, pro uh, the province that the site is ready to proceed. So to date, we have 153 new tower sites have been released to construction. And so we are making good progress on the 260 sites that we are working to build on. After we have the notification completed, site preparation is uh, starts with the ordering of the delivery of supplies and construction to begin. So the last step is, uh, even though it takes the time, is it really is uh, at the end of the wagon on this one. The other piece that's critical for us from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, as well as from the OWC, is that the consultation with the Indigenous communities and organizations is an ongoing process through the duration of the project. We meet monthly with our Indigenous, uh, with the Indigenous communities that uh, we are working with throughout Eastern Ontario, and we have 18 communities that we, um, we do communicate regularly to on these projects. Next slide, please. So the duty to consult. Um, ERN has been delegated the duty to consult with those 18 Indigenous communities and organizations by the Crown. This was not um, a an item that was uh, was see, uh, foreshadowed as coming to us as part of our accountability, but we have um, taken this on, this challenge on, and we have learned a great deal over the last uh, two years working with the Indigenous communities on mitigation, uh, natural heritage, um, uh, a number of different challenges that we were unaware of. So it has been a really uh, large learning opportunity for us to go through this and create some very interesting documentation around mitigation, uh, some of our um, uh, species at risks uh, reviews, et cetera. So um, it has 
come with some challenges to our ability to build sites, but there's been a, a, a huge upside on it as far as learning uh, from the learnings from the Indigenous communities to our organization. We are dedicated to working closely with these communities and organizations and addressing concerns about the impact of the CELGAP project on territorial and treaty rights. As the ORN and the OWC strongly believe that the benefits of the project must extend to all communities, municipal and Indigenous, in Eastern Ontario. We've completed archaeological and her natural heritage assessments on 153 new tower sites to date. And we've been part of more than 120 meetings and phone calls with Indigenous communities and organizations so far. We've also developed uh, uh, some training documentations to assist the staff in the field, not just ours, but also uh, Rogers when they're doing the construction. So they're aware of the mitigations that have been agreed to as part of this project. Next slide, please. The towers, most of the towers do range between uh, 60 to 90 meters in height. They do support 4, uh, 4G and 5G. Uh, the radios that are being put on them will support those. And having both those allows for incremental capacity on site and future proof those networks. So we are not just building for today, but for tomorrow as well. Next slide, please. The equipment on the tower. So the antenna, we just like to put this in here for a reference. So the antennas are about the height of a door and they weigh about as much as a refrigerator. So in Roger's case, or in, in a lot of telecommunication, it could be anywhere between three to six of those put on the top of each of those towers. So uh, not a small task uh, to get those up there or for that structure to be able to support those. They are in a new tower build, generally attached uh, on the ground, and then they are lifted in place by a crane. But in the upgrades, uh, when they're doing those, they can be, um, they can be lifted by a crane, but more often than not, uh, there could be an installation crew on there winching those things into place. So uh, again, not a small effort to put those on. Next slide, please. So the initiatives for the Eastern Ontario Regional Network, we are looking to complete 80 to 85 new towers and co-locations this year. Um, that is an aggressive target, but we feel that we are uh, in the right direction. Most of the upgrades to the existing towers uh, will be completed this year. Uh, we did uh, introduce a new board of directors in April, uh, so we'll turn over there and has been uh, very interesting for us. Uh, collaboration with the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council, as well as the Eastern Ontario Wardens Cau Caucus on affordable housing, uh, which I think, I think you'll hear more about. Um, we're working with the EOLC, so the Leadership Council on the permitting system, which is a um, an interesting um collaboration between us on, uh, it's called Permit Central, but essentially looking to streamline some of the challenges we see in municipal consents, right-of-way access, uh, and where we're concerned mostly, where we see the biggest opportunity in this is with uh, the ASIP prog uh, program, which is the, Ontario, the province of Ontario's um, broadband project. Um, we're concerned that there's a number of municipalities that will be inundated with or overwhelmed with the number of permits that um, that service providers will be coming look, looking for. So uh, the timelines on those projects are very tight. So we're looking to find a system that may be a benefit to the local municipalities as well as to the ISPs or to the telecom providers or the broadband providers uh, to be able to find a, a, a mutual way to permit better. and. Uh, best practices, learning from these things to find a better way to do these things. We are investigating the possibilities of the public safety broadband network for the region. And this has come up in discussions with a few of the different counties. So we are looking into this. We're supporting uh, Infrastructure Ontario, IO, on the ASIP broadband program. So that is the $4 billion province of Ontario broadband program that's being rolled out right now until the end of 2025. And we we're working on a regional municipal approach to address cybersecurity uh, gaps throughout. So we are working with the Eastern Ontario IT team to start looking at a uh, cybersecurity framework that might be uh, able to assist in closing some gaps and, and again, best practices, sharing resources, et cetera. So next slide, I think that's, that's it for us. I'm sorry, Warden Hogg, you're muted.
Does anyone have any questions of uh, Mr. St. Pierre or Ms. Severson? Deputy uh, Warden. Yeah. Yes, thank thank you, uh, Warden Hogg. Uh, yeah, so all the uh, uh, towers that are being put in, or or all the co-locations, this is this is a contract with Rogers. So the concerns that have been expressed um, about uh, some of the gaps that exist, um, would you anticipate that Rogers is going to cover those gaps? Uh, and if so, does that mean people will? basically who are in those areas have to uh, switch to a Rogers provider uh, in order to overcome the difficulties they've been having with other providers. So based on the propagation mapping that we've been provided by Rogers and the plan that was provided, I would say yes, most of those areas. There may be a few little spots where we don't see a lot of, um, uh, we didn't see uh, due to the impact, we didn't see a lot of population, but yes, those would be covered in those in that plan. Um, it is on the Rogers network, which is separate from a Bell or, or a TELUS network. So there is giving options to local residents to be able to, to find other providers if they so see, see fit. But based on the mapping we have, we do feel comfortable and confident that we will be able to close those gaps for voice coverage, yes. Thank you. Uh, one more, if I may, uh, Warden. Go ahead. Um, how, how much area does one... Um, one tower installation typically cover? <laughs> <laughs> These are always the uh, the tricky questions because it depends where the tower is. So if you're on the leeward side of the lake, is there white pine in the area? Is it uh, granite cut through? You know, if I think of going up Highway 41, it's uh, where is the tower located? Um, you know, and the height of the tower, the height of the antenna, how it's being received. So it is challenging to answer that. Uh, and also from whether it's a voice call or high definition or standard definition, um, you know, voice we used to say was sort of that 15 kilometer radius was an approximate on that, depending. But again, there's a, there's a number of challenges within the topography of a territory that may impact those services. Uh, HD or high definition is less than that. So it's usually, I think Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of that five to eight kilometer radius is kind of what we propose it to be. And standard definition is a little bit more than that. So. Okay. Okay. That's that's a greater range than I've been led to believe. So we won't be seeing a tower every five kilometers eventually. It's a, there'll be a little more spread out. That's good. Thank you. Did I understand you correctly when you said that towers could not be located on Crown land? That is correct. Part of our agreement with the, the province and the federal government uh, does not have us and, and maybe Lisa, if you don't mind, because you've explained this once well today already, but um, does not allow us to to build towers on Crown land. It opens up an environmental assessment that doesn't just impact that one site, but would impact all of our tower sites. And traditionally through you, uh, your honor, they um, traditionally towers don't require environmental assessments. And so in light of what the project was based on, um, we were exempt from doing an environmental assessment on the entire project, uh, but if we go on to Crown Land, it triggers that. So for all 260 sites. Given the fact that we have 75% Crown Land in our township, it certainly restricts the locations. You, you can appreciate some of the challenges we've been having to find suitable locations and, uh, and, and landlords who may be open to having a tower hosted. So. Councillor Calvert. No, I'm sorry, I started scratching my head, sorry. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Councillor yeah. Fritz. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, the uh, question I have is, it looks like um, this year you're, you're looking at 80 to 85 new tower and, and co-locates um, being, I guess, completed. And uh, I, I believe there's 334 of those in total in the project, which means 250 are left. So it, my question is, is there a, just a, 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 do you have an idea sort of how that spread would be between 2024 and 2025 in terms of construction or are there just too many unknowns right now? 
Well, there there are still a number of unknowns that we're dealing with. We don't have all of our uh, land secured yet, which is a challenge. Um, we are still running into some high cost areas, which need to be reassessed as far as um, distance from hydro, uh, from fiber connectivity, uh, relation to homes and houses. So we are we haven't secured everything yet. So there is a challenge for that for sure. So we don't have a formula laid out that I'd be comfortable sharing with you right now. Uh, but we do appreciate uh, the mathematics on that when you're looking at it and the challenges that are ahead of us. And we are uh, regularly discussing that with Rogers as our partner in this to ensure that we are going to be able to meet our targets by the end of 2025. Thank you. Yeah, because when I was looking at it, you know, there's a lot of work to do. And not that this isn't a great project, and I'm pretty excited about it. But yeah. yeah. No, we we share your uh, your concerns on the math on that as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Henry. Thanks, Henry. Um, I live within uh, three quarters of a kilometer of the tower that was just assembled in Enterprise, Ontario. Uh, sorry about the Ontario part, obviously. Um, have it. I'm just curious. I know that you mentioned something about completion of these towers and when they'd be completed. Is there any idea when that particular tower may be active? I have had people ask and it'd be nice if I could tell them roughly. Um, we'll take that one away and, and try to get you a, a date when we think it will be active. You said it's in the forms of construction right now, you said? Yes, actually there was a gentleman on it near the top. I believe he was uh, rigging up the antenna just in the past two weeks. So it just brought okay. a lot of attention to it and of course, people approach me being in the village or in the hamlet. Okay, no, let us take that away and we'll see if we can get you a better timeline so we have more information for you, something you can share with your constituents. That'd be great. Just, you know, it's nice that they have even a rough answer would be helpful. And also um, one other thing, you had mentioned, of course, we've kind of covered the Rogers thing. How would we ever know if a tower is, is become a dual purpose tower, as in if Bell and Telus have, partnered with Rogers to gain access to that tower. It would be a shame if people in the village were to switch to Rogers just to gain access and get better coverage and find out that there's already agreement being negotiated to offer the other carriers space on that tower. And they, they just needed to stay put with that current carrier. And just, that's one of the things I know people are gonna be asking about. No, and those are fair questions. And we are working through a process to try to find better ways to communicate that. So Rogers and, and let's say Bell in this case would have co-location corporate agreements. We don't know though, uh, because it's not in the scope of our project, we don't know which towers, uh, you know, the other party may want to join. So we are trying to find a way to uh, to explore that information to a point where we feel we'd be comfortable to to share that. But as of right now, we don't have access to that information. And it really hasn't been a, a full scope for us, just we've been trying to get these towers built right now. So knowing that they have a co-location agreement in place, we would think that that would drive that opportunity for, in this case, a Bell to go on a Rogers Tower, or tower um, just for their own business model, but. Great, no problem, thank you. Other questions, anyone? Uh, yes, Wendell Land, Councillor. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Warden Hope. Uh, just a few quick questions. Um, you mentioned that the uh, ROI would be 20 to one and leading up to 50 to one. And how do you uh, manage that? How do you uh, reach those goals? So initially, that's just a basic calculation on the amount of funds put forward by the county versus the number of assets that are being built in that area. So there's a, uh, a cost associated with a, a new tower build. Uh, there's a cost associated with a co-location and there's costs associated with upgrades. So it is a very primary return investment uh, calculation that we did just at this point to sort of test the waters to see what that would look like. We do plan on doing a more in-depth one uh, when the project has been finished and we know where the final towers and the final coverage maps look like. But it was a very um, basic, um, you know, investment versus asset allocation uh, calculation that was done to be able to pull that number together. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, you said that you uh, had come to some resolution regarding the dark skies location. And I was just wondering, I, I was aware of those issues and I wondered how they were mitigated. 
in this case, I believe the tower, I don't believe we moved the tower in this one, but I can get more information on this. But when we did the final calculations, it was deemed that it was not in the direct line of sight for the dark sky areas. Okay. The, the way the tower was leveled onto the horizon did not impact the overall, um, did not overall uh, impact the, the, the area. So there was quite a bit of discussion just to ensure that based on the propagation and the mapping that it was able to be, uh, uh, it was reviewed and, and deemed not to be impactful. And just one last, if I might, um, you discussed about the consultation process uh, and you mentioned about the Indigenous consultation, um, but how have you had to, how do you consult with neighbours? Because they're the ones who are directly impacted by the projects that, uh, that are going up. Uh, what's that process like with the neighbors? Sorry, as far as a tower for communication to the neighbors, we're in the vicinity of an area that's um, a tower is to be built? Correct. Okay. Uh, no, typically that would, there would be communication done through the local papers as well as through some of the local municipalities uh, with outreach going on to the neighbors in, in where the tower is being built. Yes, Lisa, you want to just add to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. It's yeah, yeah. usually, it's based on um, different tower heights. So a 90 meter tower would be three times the tower height and they would take where that point is proposed and then basically a, a circle circumference around that. Um, and those would be the neighbors that they would be um, notifying. If your municipality has a um, has a tower siting uh, bylaw or policy in place, you can, as a municipality, um, ask for public information sessions uh, to be held around that tower. If you don't have your own uh, policy or bylaw in place, um, it diverts back to the ISED policy and uh, public information sessions are not a requirement. Any other questions or comments? I have a question, Warden Hogg. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Warden. Um, as a, just a standard practice, when a new tower is constructed, they, they all require hydro, right, to work? And uh, in the case of a hydro outage, do they work? Uh, I'm just, uh, the, when we had a Derrico, Derrico rip through Addington Highlands, we had uh, no power. And therefore, we had no cell service for several days as well. Yes, so they do require hydro. And when we lose hydro, typically, in most cases, there is a generator backup. The challenge, though, is <laughs> the first thing that happens when you lose your, your, your phone is you pick up the phone and you try to call somebody, and it automatically goes to that tower. So in the case like the Derrico or you know an emergency like that, even though there's a generator that is trying to keep that tower on, up, up and running, the usage spikes right away as soon as that happens, which automatically impacts the ability of that generator and those batteries to be able to keep going. In many cases, um, the utilities are able to come out to put remote or, or different generators on where they can fill those up with, uh, with fuel to ensure that they have something, but sometimes that takes some time as well, and they don't realize how fast they think they may have eight hours and they find out they only had three hours because the usage on that tower was way higher than they would have anticipated. So um, they are aware, typically there are generator hookups that are able to be put onto those so they can connect a generator when and if required on top of the battery backups that are in there for, that should last in the range of six to eight hours, but again, depends on usage. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fritch. Thank you, Warden Hogan. Just to follow up to Councillor Hook's question, uh, Jason, who actually, if this, if a back a standby gener a backup generator is required or a portable one or one on wheels, who actually installs that? Let's, let's say there is an outage for a day and a half, two days, and your batteries are dead. So who's, it who's responsible for it? It depends who the, the provider is and who their maintenance contract would be. But again, um, in the case of a Bell, they have their own technicians who would be accountable for that. Uh, Rogers would have a, an organization that would be similarly accountable for that. So they would have groups that they would be, uh, would be available to do that work. Okay, so 
the service provider, they have the full accountability for that. That would fall in theirs, yes. Thank you. Anything else? If not, thank you very much for, to Jason and Lisa, and I need a motion to receive that presentation from EOR. Councilor Hagedorn, Councilor Fritsch, all in favor? That's carried. Once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very thank much you for inviting us. Everyone. Yep, we're very appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, we've got a uh, presentation from uh, Mr. Kaiser that was forwarded from the council meeting last uh, last week. I'm not sure how this is to be. Warden Hogg, that was placed on the agenda so that uh, the EORN staff would be made aware of it of his concerns. So what should I do as a, as a motion? What, what should I do with it? Overseas. Yes, uh, I, I would move uh, that we receive that and uh, make sure that uh, uh, you and staff receive it. Um, I, I think based on on what we've been told um the answer to max kaiser is eventually uh, he's gonna have to switch to rogers unless uh, his telus provider um can co-locate or something like that it sounds like uh, the gap should be addressed by this uh there's probably gonna be a new tower in that area uh, but basically my motion is simply to receive it and, and make sure that you and staff uh, are aware of it Okay, is there a second there? Councillor Davidson, any com comments? Ready for the vote. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, Eastern Ontario Warden's Caucus update. Uh, I believe Warden Iman is here and I'll turn the floor over to him. Peter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Warden Hogg. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening, and, and I'll turn it over to Meredith uh, very quickly. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Lennox and Addington, and, uh, and I have to admit some disappointment that we're not in person in your chambers. I, I'm a great admirer of your building, and I, I certainly love being in your chambers and the and the uh, and your council room that adjoins it. So uh, you know that's my one regret about Zoom about uh, appearing here this evening. Um, and I would like to add um, our gratitude. Uh, to Lennox and Addington, uh, the, especially uh, as it's well known, the Warden Hogg, I was a, a mayor next door to him uh, in Greater Madawaska for many years, and, and we, you know, we, we've cooperated on many, many projects, and I've benefited from his advice uh, over the years. Uh, I served previously with the Warden's Caucus for five years, uh, and we crossed paths there as well, and uh, so we're very thankful for the, uh, for the leadership that all of your wardens and guidance that all of your wardens have presented to us over the years. We're especially grateful for the efforts uh, and uh, and data and time that your CAOs and especially Brenda at this point has presented, but all of your divisions have contributed information and time, whether it's your paramedics or, or, uh, or uh, Ontario Works on a regular basis. And the Wardens Caucus works and has credibility because of the efforts of your staff and the staff of the other municipalities who contribute. We have a good reputation. We don't go whining in to talk to a minister. We walk in and we define what the problem is. We define a very reasonable, uh, achievable solution. Uh, and then we petition uh, the government or our others for, for funding and we deliver. And you're gonna see that when you, when you uh, uh, are, uh, have Meredith's presentation. Um, but I just want to, re to remind you that those achievements are based on the efforts of your staff and the rest of the staff across uh, across the warden's caucus, and on the on the people who have preceded myself and Warden Hogg sitting uh, at uh, at the table for East Ontario Warden's Caucus. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our our manager of of uh, policy and, and government relations, Meredith Stavely Watson, who has a 
a vast uh, a vast storehouse of information to give you right now. So Meredith, please uh, please continue. Excellent. And through you, Your Honor, good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here um, with your county council this evening, joined uh, with the uh, chair of the EWC, Warden Peter Eman, and also uh, CAO of Hastings County, Jim Pine. I'm going to take you through a very high level presentation of the EWC's history and accomplishments, who we are, what we do, our strategic priorities. And then I'm going to pass it back to Chair Eman to do an introduction of our seven and seven regional housing plan, which Jim will then present on and provide more details. Perfect. Hoping everyone can see that. So the EOWC um, is a nonprofit incorporated organization um, comprised of the 13 heads of council of uh, 13 upper tier and single tier municipalities across the region of rural Eastern Ontario. We cover approximately 50,000 square kilometers from Northumberland County all the way east to the Quebec border and then all the way north up to Renfrew County uh, Algonquin Park area. Uh, the EWC supports and advocates on behalf of a total of 103 uh, member municipalities and that's covering approximately uh, 750,000 people and residents and we really work to champion our rural voice and our priorities while working with government stakeholders, uh, the media, and businesses. The EUWC was established in 2002, and we were incorporated in 2008. So we have been around now for a number of decades, and uh, it really proves that our, our efforts um, and our approach to advocacy and championship for the region have, have been working. We do find that people pay attention when you come together with a regional voice. And uh, that's what we've been able to do with your support, uh, your council support, your staff support, and uh, the rest of our members on behalf of the region. Here on this slide is just a, a quick map uh, showing you the, EU, the makeup of the EUWC, as well as a list of our, our 13 members. So what we do, uh, this slide just show, outlines uh, what the EWC gets up to at a very high level. So we work very hard on our advocacy on behalf of the region. As I said, making sure that that rural voice is really um, has a say at the table when there's policy being put together and uh, big decisions on behalf of the province and also the federal government. We do a number of research and really come to the table with evidence and like to have a data um, approach with local examples and local stories showcasing um, why our priorities are important and why uh, we should be listened to and uh, be part of those conversations. Uh, we've really worked hard, especially in the past year, and I'd like to say, um, in uh, strengthening our partnerships, uh, not only with our member municipalities, uh, but also with associations like AMO, like the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, uh, as well as with our local counterparts, the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus, and our counterparts in the West as well, the Western Ontario Warden's Caucus, to name a few. Recently, we've also engaged with uh, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, for example. So really working to get that, that voice out there um, on behalf of the region. We also produce a number of communications that includes letters, different submissions. We're currently doing a newsletter, which hopefully you've received. Uh, and we also are active on, on a number of social media platforms. We also, as I said, do our research. So really engaging and doing that consultation work and monitoring federal and provincial and municipal legislation bylaws, et cetera. This is just a quick governance chart showing you our makeup. So we have Chair Eamon, of course, with us tonight from Renfrew County. And our current vice chair is Warden Bonnie Clark for Peterborough County. Our chairs uh, typically rotate every year. Um, and there is uh, kind of a vote for chair during our annual, gen annual uh, general meeting in January every year. 
we have the 13 elected officials um, who, who provide a direction to our 13 uh, CAOs. And uh, this year, our secretary treasurer is Craig Kelly, who I work with very closely. And I also work closely with Heather Wrightley, who's our policy and administrative coordinator, and also works with Eorn. We've also established this summer our, our first um, inaugural full-time internship program. So we have Mary for Golden uh, with us this summer as well, which is very exciting. And just speaking to the staff working groups, we have a number of staff working groups uh, that we pull information um, from. And uh, this might include a GIS group, uh, HR group, planning, et cetera, depending on our strategic priorities and inform our work. So we're very appreciative of, of those staff who've been involved. Not gonna go through too much in detail here, but this just gives you a good idea of what we've been up to uh, in the past year. So um, we were invited to speak on the national stage at FCM and actually appeared on, on main stage, which was quite exciting. Um, we've done a number of recent releases in terms of our paramedic services, different submissions, uh, et cetera. And so again, I'm not gonna go through these, uh, I believe you have the presentation, but just showing you we've been busy, we've been active and we've been out there representing on behalf of the region. Perfect, so I'm gonna speak a little bit more tonight about our three strategic priorities for 2023. Our first one is affordable and attainable housing. So last June, and actually hosted by uh, the County of Lennox and Addington, um, we did host a regional housing summit that was made up of municipal staff from both the local and upper tier level and single tiers uh, from various departments. And so we came together to share feedback and ideas and also find recommendations of how we could do things better on behalf of the region and, and, and in ourselves as municipalities but also what we could uh, recommend to the province and also the federal government. And this is uh, actually where the idea of the seven and seven regional housing plan was born. One of the projects that we've been uh, working on uh, is the rural housing information system, the RHIS. And so the EUWC was successful uh, in their application to uh, a grant by CMHC back in 2021 for $1.4 million. And this uh, went towards the idea of filling the rural information gap when we're trying to plan for and develop housing across the region of rural Eastern Ontario. And this of course could spill over in a good way to other rural communities. And so we've been working to develop the RHIS, which is a digital data tool so you can go online, it's in one central location and it's going to be launched this summer. There's free access for our 103 member municipalities because of the, the time and resource investment that the EUWC has put in. And basically you can go on this website, you can look up market rent, you can look up where different assets are, different zoning. It's, it's essentially a one-stop shop where that data can be. There's also a comparison tool, tool so for example, I could compare um, the town of Bancroft to uh, the town of Renfrew or the county of Frontenac, for example, and it shows you where um, it might be ideal to build and, and, and what information you may need. And so that should be launched this year, um, or sorry, this summer. The EUWC is remaining the founder of the RHIS and will be involved in that capacity but we have passed management and operating um, over to the Rural Ontario Institute. So that's who uh, is operating it. And I know that they're happy to come and do a presentation to your, your council, explaining a little bit more and walking you through the RHIS. Again, I don't wanna steal Jim's thunder here, but the seven and seven uh, project is something we've been really pushing. It's a very bold and innovative approach to uh, building affordable and market rate housing across the region. Other two pieces that we've been working on under our housing priority include the financial framework. As you all know, um, Ontario is the only province uh, across Canada that has been mandated to operate uh, community housing. So we believe because of that responsibility that we hold, uh, municipalities in Ontario deserve to have 
a financial framework in order to better prepare and plan and have a sustainable uh, way to, to make sure that housing is, is strong and truly supportive of our residents, as well as those services. And secondly, under the housing priority, we are asking the province and the federal government to come together to streamline um, and state their definitions of both attainable housing and affordable housing. So making sure that those match up at both the federal and provincial levels, as well as making sure that the metrics associated with them align and, and also make sense for rural communities, not just urban cities. Our second priority of 2023 out of the three is paramedic services. So the EWC has long been calling for um, municipalities to have a seat at the decision-making table and making sure that there is dedicated municipal representation when it comes to community health care, as we've been taking on larger roles in this, in this capacity. Under the paramedic services priority, and back in 2019, the EUWC published a report, um, which was an overview of the region's paramedic uh, services and community paramedic services situation. So this is database showing calls, uh, volume, uh, dispatch, call out, offload delays, servicing, where ambulances are, et cetera. So it's a very data-driven report, very appreciated by the province. And so what we decided to do this year was to update that previous uh, data from that report because there'd been such a change and an increase uh, in reliance of the paramedic service. And so we wanted to show that refresh uh, based on the pandemic and post-pandemic numbers. So that has been recently launched uh, last month and is also available on our website. And you can see the link here. You can also see here the list of the four recommendations. So permanent, sustain, permanent sustainable and predictable funding, support, support paramedic services and community paramedic efforts. Secondly, modernizing the dispatch system. Thirdly, reducing offload delays at hospitals to make sure that paramedics are spending more of their hours out in the communities uh, versus being uh, stuck at the hospital. Um, and fourthly, increasing enrollment of par paramedic students to community college programs. And so that's what we're bringing um, to, to AMO and hopefully when we meet with the Minister of Health uh, this August. Our third priority is long-term care. And again, in a similar vein to the paramedic services, really advocating for that safer model. Um, the UWC was successful and was an early advocate of the four hours of care model. Um, so getting that up for the province for um, resident care and long-term care homes. And we commend the province, province for implementing that. However, there needs to be the staffing and supports and uh, system in place to make sure we can get to that get to that goal successfully, especially in our rural communities. And so because of that, we're advocating this year to make sure that there's proper implementation and support for the province's human resources strategy, which was released in previous years. And that's really uh, focused on the staff shortages. Secondly, um, eliminating and or regulating staffing agencies that pose uh, a, a really unsustainable resource and cost burden on municipal long-term care home budgets. And thirdly, um, asking that the province review and modernize the long-term care funding framework. Um, to making sure that it's equitable for rural and municipal homes. As you may be aware, the EUWC, we don't just focus on our main strategic priorities, we also focus on continued advocacy ideas. So these are issues of ongoing importance that have a, a regional voice or perspective. Um, so, so recently we've done this, uh, maybe a call for support for uh, the Southeastern Ontario uh, film industry, for example, um, we've done uh, some work on flooding in the past. So um, just showing you that uh, you have an ear and a partner in us if there's an issue that you feel should get a little bit more momentum and has the regional um, impact, we're happy to, to support with our, our communications and advocacy work. And again, I won't go through these uh, next couple of slides in detail, but just showing uh, what we've been up to um, 
what's keeping us busy, a number of those uh, delegation meetings coming up, ones we've done in the past, uh, different engagement, budget submissions, et cetera, and uh, really working hard on that seven and seven meeting with our provincial and federal counterparts, as well as with you uh, and our other municipal members. And again, um, if you'd like to contact us, um, please reach out uh, at this email. Uh, feel free to review our website. We are doing a website refresh and branding refresh right now. So uh, hopefully that will come to fruition at the end of the summer. And please feel free to follow us on uh, our, our social uh, LinkedIn and Twitter pages as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. Does anyone have questions of Meredith on their presentation? Councillor Wise. Yes, uh, thank you, Warden Hogg. Uh, yeah, that was uh, very interesting and uh, it's wonderful to have this uh, um, advocacy on, on behalf of uh, all the municipalities that you serve. Um, in the past, I recall, and this is going back uh, maybe three, four, five years, um, one of your um, issues that you were promoting or advocating uh, was the expansion of uh, natural gas infrastructure in, uh, in Eastern Ontario. And given the uh, concerns and, and policy directions around climate change um, and the supposed phasing out of fossil fuel burning, I'm wondering if, if that policy was reviewed and, and, uh, and modified or abandoned. Uh, just just what, what happened to that one? Through you, Your Honor. Thank you for the question, um, Deputy Jarwis. Um, but uh, I think for this, it is something that we've reviewed in previous years. It's not something that we've looked at um, in this current year as it's not kind of one of our main strategic priorities, but it's been something that's brought forward in the past and is kind of a good example of those continued advocacy items that it was speaking to. Um, but it, it's something that we're not, we haven't currently uh, focused on this year. We are definitely seeing um, different kind of more green approaches in terms of housing, uh, in terms of our seven and seven project, in terms of maybe what uh, AMO, the uh, FCM and different orders of government are pushing. So it's something we're definitely discussing internally and, and seeing how we can implement that. And I'm not sure um, if the chair at all wants to add to that or. Certainly I could add to that. I think, uh, thank you for the question. It's a good question too. It's one of those things, uh, examples of, we established a relationship with, with uh, one of the gas companies and we were working as a partnership with them in, in promoting it. Um, and I think it was fundamentally brought to us by the Ontario Federation of Agriculture uh, to start the link up because they were uh, worried about greenhouses and, and, and such. And so we, we did some work with them. And then the government, uh, the provincial government announced a, a series of programs and the federal government had some programs. So we backed off a little bit, uh, I think, because there was some uh, some programming coming forward from the two senior levels of government. And um, as, as Meredith has suggested, we're starting to hear again more that people aren't happy or aren't satisfied or the, the existing programs or the, or the previous programs haven't met the need entirely. And so I think at some point you're going to, you, you'll probably see us dip our toe in that tepid bathwater again and uh, take a look at it, uh, uh, you know, if we find some partnerships or, or if we, uh, if we can start some, some common dialogue. Again, it's a matter of resources for us. Uh, so we have to find effective partnerships, but thank you for the question. And it's certainly something, um, you know, Meredith, myself and, and uh, uh, Craig Kelly, the CIO of the County of Renfrew and, uh, and Sheridan, the CIO of Peterborough County and, and the vice chair, Bonnie Clark, we get together on a monthly basis for a telephone call just to, to have a go around to make sure we're on, on, on track with items. And we'll, I know Meredith will certainly inject this in the conversation and uh, we'll in turn uh, talk to our CIOs about it. So we'll, 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 we'll promise you that we'll take another look at it. I can't give you a timeline suggesting it'll happen in August, but we'll, we'll take another look at it and, and uh, you, you know, I'm sure you'll hear something from Warden Hogg through the minutes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just, just a little follow-up comment. Uh, uh, my concern isn't that we won't be getting expanded natural gas infrastructure. My concern is that 
um, it would be a, a dead end street to go down that route at this point. Uh, it's, it's increasingly clear that uh, electrification and, and other non-emitting sources of energy are the way to go and increasing pipeline uh, infrastructure is just going to result in a stranded asset. So that, that's okay. just my editorial comment. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Way too keen to please. So thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Go ahead. I have, I have a question. Um, Councillor McDonald from Stone Mills. Thank you, Warden Hogg. Um, it was mentioned about uh, long-term care that exists. And I just wondered in a lot of the smaller municipalities, the long-term care that exists is private. Is there anything that government and municipalities can do for the smaller private long-term care? Through you, Your Honor. Um, currently, our long-term care advocacy just covers municipal long-term care homes and is concerned about municipal homes. However, a good resource for that, um, who we work very close we, closely with, might be Advantage, and they um, cover all of the homes, um, mostly across Ontario and and have some really good recommendations that are applicable for not only the private um, sector, but also municipalities and the nonprofit sector as well. So it's advantage. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? If not, I guess I need a motion to receive Meredith's presentation. Mover and a second, Councillor Fritsch and Councillor Davison. Any further comments? All in favor? That's carried. Now we've got a uh, presentation on the EOWC 7 and 7 Regional Housing Plan. Peter. Yes, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Warden Hogg. And, and through you to, uh, to Council and Council members and, and your community, it's a, it's a great pleasure for us to be here this evening. And I'd like to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you today about the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus 7 in 7 Regional Housing Plan. It's a snappy title. Um, so as the 2023 Chair of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, I'm pleased to be here today and to be joined by CEO Jim Pine, who I think all of you know uh, and, uh, and like myself, have a great admiration for, and Meredith Stavely Watson, who is our Caucus Manager of Government Relations and Policy. And I think when I introduced her the first time, I had that backwards. And so I know our time with you is short, so we're going to share the podium and I'm going to get started. I believe that I can safely assume that housing and particularly lack of affordable housing is one of your council's top concerns. I know it is for the 13 members of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. In fact, tackling the housing and related homelessness issues is our primary priority as a group. There is a chronic and serious supply problem of not only regular housing, but community or social housing across our region. And that is certainly the case in Renfrew County, and I'm uh, assuming it's similar for you here in Atlantic and Addington. Wait lists for community housing continue to grow, and across Eastern Ontario, we know that there are between 12 and 14,000 households in desperate need of access to community housing that our municipalities operate. People on our community housing wait list, whether it's here or in the county, are left in my home county, I'm sorry, are left waiting on average four and a half years, and in some cases, 10 years to get safe access to affordable community housing. Each of us in our jurisdiction has been doing our very best over the years to try and tackle this supply challenge. While we have made progress, it's just not enough to solve the problem. That's why the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus has come together to put our collective resources and ex experience into a bold new regional solution. It's big, it's definitely bold, and it's doable. We know that a different approach to try and solve the housing problem has to be found. The seven and seven plan offers a chance to really make a profound difference. The Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus is a leader in delivering big regional projects. You heard from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network tonight about our broadband and cellular projects, which are examples of solving problems region-wide in an effective and cost-efficient manner. I am hopeful and we will request uh, that you consider uh, supporting us 
uh, we hope that your council sees the merit in this approach and will support our efforts to convince the federal and provincial governments to invest and partner with us as well. We need both senior levels of government to participate. As you've seen from the year-end models, it can, it's a very successful way of going forward. Thank you for your time and consideration. And, and uh, I'll turn this over to Jim Pine, who will lead us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my internet is not very good today, unfortunately. Um, so I'm gonna leave my camera off if that's okay. And if, uh, if it gets really bad, Meredith is gonna take over. So hopefully you continue to, to hear me. So yeah, the, I, I'd like to give you just a, a little more detail on what we're proposing for uh, the seven and seven plan. We can go to the next slide, please. As, uh, as the chair indicated, uh, what we're trying to do is cover an area uh, that serves the EOW region, but also of course, the separated communities, uh, the 10 separated communities across Eastern Ontario places like uh, Peterborough and Kingston, Belleville and Quinney Weston in, in Hastings County. It's a large area. It's about uh, altogether about a million uh, three in terms of population. And it's about the same size as the province of Nova Scotia. But we realized that in trying to solve uh, for the problem of uh, affordable housing uh, and market rate uh, rental housing, we needed to come together as a group to try and do this. We've all been trying to work in our own lanes and we realized last year that if we come together, we think this is the perfect opportunity to do another region-wide project to solve this uh, or help solve this incredibly important uh, challenge that we're all facing in our local communities and in our counties. Next slide. As, uh, as the chair indicated that uh, when we got together last year, we looked at the wait lists uh, that each of us have as housing providers uh, in the EOWC region. Uh, and that wait list uh, includes all uh, kinds of, uh, of different households uh, from those who, who uh, re require uh, rental assistance uh, to help pay for it to those that are, are, are working but simply can't find uh, affordable rental accommodation. Uh, it's a large list and growing. Uh, and uh, as the chair said, uh, it seems quite unreasonable that people have to wait uh, at least five years and sometimes 10 years uh, to get housed. And so when we said that we needed to do something, it would be better if we came together as a group to try and solve the problem. And that's what this project's really about. Next slide. We also know that uh, and support, of course, the province's drive uh, to get uh, uh, 1.5 million homes uh, built across the province by 2031. What we really wanna make sure is that the community rental housing uh, is included as, as part of that solution. Uh, and this is where uh, our plan comes into place. Uh, we, we wanna serve the people that we, we serve off our wait lists. Um, and in looking at the challenge, the warden's caucus said, let's try and tackle at least 50% of the supply problem in terms of the, uh, the number of uh, uh, sort of rent geared or affordable community rental units. But we also think if we can work together with the private sector, as we have in other projects, we can drive a further 21,000 market rate units uh, uh, in as part of this project. So what we're really talking about in the next slide is a total of about 28,000 uh, units, pretty substantial number. Um, but even at that, we know that from CMHCs um, and Stats Canada, our core housing needs in Eastern Ontario are greater than that, but this is a significant step forward if we can do this project uh, that the Warden's Caucus would love to do. We also know that we've got some great evidence to support what we're doing. Scotiabank came out uh, in, uh, in January of this year with a report that really validated what the Warden's Caucus is trying to do. It said that uh, Canada needs to double, uh, at least double, it's social housing stock to help those in its greatest need. So they're telling uh, government that more needs to be done, much more. And they say that this is a great solution for unlocking the supply uh, as part of the continuum. We need, we need more, that's what we really need. The fourth bullet really is the one that stands out for me because what Scotiabank is saying to governments, that is the federal and provincial governments, that they need these higher rates of concessionality or what that really means is that governments need to invest in uh, the building of, of housing. So they need greater grant-based approaches. 
It's good to have policies in place, but really what's required as well is direct investment. And it really is, uh, as the Scotiabank says, the most cost efficient way to try and solve this problem uh, in the long run. So we found this evidence uh, very much supports what the caucus wants to do. And we were pleased to see that one of the Canada's largest banks coming out with this proposal as well, or these recommendations. Next slide. But we know that uh, this is really a big and bold project. It is. Maybe Meredith, okay, you want to step so in? Oh. No. Right. Okay. Meredith, you want to take over? We can hear you again, Jim. Can you? Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. So as I said, we'll take all the sectors to participate in, in this project. Can we go to the next slide, please? It's a big project, as we've mentioned. We estimate the cost for the 7,000 units at about $3.1 billion. That's based on about $440,000 per, uh, per unit. It's an average that we've... Uh, we've developed uh, amongst ourselves based on the work that uh, we've done over the years as uh, our provider. So we validated the number. But the good news is, is that if we can invest this $3.1 billion, residential housing, the construction of residential housing has a huge multiplier effect, at least three times. So what we're doing with this project is not only building units to house people, we're stimulating the regional economy to a, at a significant extent. We estimate at least $9 billion worth of economic activity if we could do this project. So it has that twin benefit of supporting people and getting them housed, but also driving our regional economy forward. Um, and we think it has, um, you know, that's a significant additional benefit for, uh, that would come with the project. Next slide. So this is a, a notional way of looking at uh, what the project might look like. What we did was uh, divided the region up into zones, not unlike we've done in the past for our broadband project, it's simply as a way to, to uh, help the procurement uh, process uh, going forward. And then we, uh, we just notionally allocated the investment that would come to each zone based on the zone's percentage share of the overall wait list. It's a pretty simple formula. So if you look at the middle, uh, we created a zone called the uh, Hastings, Lennox and Addington, Prince Edward County zone. I think we have about 26% of, of the wait list amongst the three of us in the zone. And so that would mean about 1,854 units would come our way out of the 7,000. Again, this is just a notional allocation and you could see how it would look across the rest of, of the region based on a zone. So a pretty significant number of units would come to, uh, to our zone, if I can call it that. Next slide. Keep going. Uh, just to break it down just a little bit further, again, based on each of our share of that, of that wait list, uh, it would look like about 1,400 units would go to Hastings, 289 to Lennox and Addington, and about 156 units to uh, Prince Edward County. But again, I keep stressing that this is just a notional look at it. I'm sure these numbers will change, um, but it seemed like a reasonable way to try and allocate out uh, the units um, if we were going forward with the full 7,000. These are just the 7,000 RGI type units. Next. In terms of the value or of the investment, you can see what it, it would mean by um, bringing those units to this particular zone. Um, 813 million in total, and then split the three ways. You can see the numbers on the slide there, again, based on the percentage share. So a substantial investment coming uh, all of our way uh, if we're able to do this. And again, multiply that by at least three times, you can see what it does for our zone economy uh, in this uh, particular case. Next slide. So as I've said before, this is a great way to not only house people who desperately need the housing, and we need those, that housing to support people who are coming to work and 
in the new businesses that are coming, particularly in L&A uh, uh, and the other parts of the region, but also for those who can't uh, afford um, it on their own. So it has that twin benefit. Next slide. The key to it all, as I've mentioned before, it are the, the partnerships and that's what EORN is very good at putting together. And the Warden's Caucus has asked the EORN to carry on and try and manage this project forward. So we'll take that expertise and, and turn it into uh, success, I think, with, uh, with this particular project. Next slide. As this slide says, I think the EOWC has got a lot of credibility uh, as the chair has indicated in delivering on time and on budget, big regional projects with the two that EORN is, uh, has done and is doing with the cell project and the broadband project before that, that's about $500 million worth of public private uh, investment uh, that we've managed and uh, brought in on budget on time. We did, went on a, an additional step this winter and uh, hired a company, a consulting firm, KMW, to um, take a, a deep dive into a regional business case to make sure that what we're proposing makes sense uh, and is doable. That report uh, and the business case is going to the Warden's Caucus shortly, but I can give you a bit of a heads up that it, it validates what we're proposing to do and really recommends that we get on with it. Um, the project will require, as we know, as uh, servicing investments. We want to make sure, and this is where the EOWC, again, has great skill. We want to make sure that housing happens in our rural communities, um, as well as in, some, in the urban communities. We want to make sure that people can have housing and can stay in our local communities, whether it's in Hastings County or, or Lenox and Addington. Um, so it, it's important that we're able to manage the project in a way that the benefit uh, is seen in rural and in uh, urban centers uh, across the, the region. But we know that servicing will be an important part uh, of the project and we're looking at different ways to do that. So we've been at it for, uh, for about uh, 10 months in a, in a big way. Uh, and uh, we are going to start consultation soon with our indigenous neighbors. Uh, we've already been starting to work with, uh, with the construction industry and the building industry and, uh, and not-for-profit uh, operators uh, around the project who seem to be quite interested in it and supportive. We're hopeful that we can launch a, uh, a pilot project in one of the zones this fall to put proof of concept to the test. Uh, and uh, we're starting to look at where that might be best done. And if all goes really well, uh, and we can convince everybody that uh, they should invest in the project, uh, we'd really like to get going in terms of releasing the um, zone RFPs uh, for construction uh, next winter. It's really important for us to get started on this project uh, ASAP because of the long waits people are already experiencing and the great need uh, that keeps uh, continuing to grow. So as the chair said, we hope that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Lennox and Addington and its member municipalities will show its support through the passing of a resolution, um, which is important to make sure government knows that we're all on side. And th there's a short video, I think, Meredith, uh, that actually probably says it better than I can. Uh, and if we played that now, then we could take questions. And I hope you could all hear me. Thank you. Perfect, and just, oh, Tracy's got it. The Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus has a track record of bringing people together to solve problems that are too big for any one government or industry. For more than a decade, the EOWC has collaborated with governments and the private sector on regional scale solutions. Now it's coming together along with partner service managers to address the housing crisis. On average, people in Eastern Ontario can wait five to 10 years for affordable community housing. We all know something must be done. The province aims to build 1.5 million homes by 2031. This goal must meet the needs of all Ontarians, rural and urban. The EOWC has a bold regional solution to tackle the wait list. Over seven years, the EOWC wants to help build 7,000 new rental units. 
Taking a more public-private approach, the plan would build a mix of community and market housing. The investment could spur thousands of more housing units across the region, helping to meet the needs of people across different incomes, ages, and stages of life. The EOWC plan takes a collaborative and innovative approach to building new supply, from funding to servicing. Greater economies of scale would reduce costs to build more, faster. We are ready to work with the provincial and federal governments, as well as for-profit and non-profit partners. Join us to create strong communities where everyone can afford a place to call home. So does thank you very much, have, Your Honor. Does anyone have questions of uh, Mr. Pine or Mr. Eman? Well, Councilor Fritch. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, Jim, I'm not sure the questions for you or, or for uh, uh, Mr. Eman, but any, anyway, uh, when it comes to funding and it, it, obviously the, the bulk of it would be uh, federal and provincial funding if it if it all yeah, works out and is successful. Is there funding that is being, I guess, talked about or broached where it would come from the actual uh, members of the EOWC uh, in terms of coming from counties? Is there a portion of that in this strategy that would that's where that some source of funding from them, because obviously if there would be, that's a long range plan and they would have to build it into their, yeah. it's certainly a budget issue on an annual basis, but it's a more strategic issue for, for them in a, in a long-term basis because it's a, a longer term project. Tony, I think Jim can get, I can give you a long answer. Jim will give you the better answer. <laughs> Let me try. Yeah, we, had, we would anticipate based on our typical EORN model, that there would be some, a, a local contribution through the counties, generally to to be the part of the project management cost of uh, of actually doing the project. Uh, we see the, our local share uh, really in two ways. Um, beyond that, oh, so I think I think what Jim was going to suggest to you is we see it in two ways. One is the assembly of land. In the various communities, um, okay. Jim, go ahead. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can. Okay. And if if we end up owning some of these uh, units at the end of the day, we'll have operating costs going forward, so that should be considered part of our our contribution as well. But in our projects before, um, the counties have uh, have helped to fund the project management side of a, of a project like this. Would be our goal is always to make it as low as possible, and typically Eorn if it's running, it is about 6%, 7%, 8%, somewhere in there in terms of project management fees. So we, we minimize our local cost, maximize the private sector investment and uh, the other government investment. But we're also looking at different ways of, of attracting capital uh, for this particular project. And there's some really interesting things going on in the capital markets that uh, we are, are exploring that would help, I think, both federal, provincial, and, and of course, local governments um, make this come uh, come to life uh, using different kinds of capital rather than taxpayer money if we can avoid it. So we're, we're, it, we're looking at different innovative ways of aggregating uh, the financing for it. So more to come on that. I appreciate that. And I expected it's, you know, obviously it's something that's in the works. So. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, where do you want to go from here? Councillor Hagedorn. Thank you, Warden. I do have just a couple of questions, if I may. Um, go ahead. The, uh, the one is you've been referring to a EORN model um, for project delivery. Um, is there so are you planning on EORN, the EORN group being the project delivery team or is there a, will it be put out 
um, that we will be developing another team with specialties in the housing market. Yeah, I, I think if I may, uh, Your Honor, that the, the decision still needs to be made by the, the Warden's Caucus on exactly how they want it to go forward. But I can say that if, if Eorn is managing it on behalf of the Warden's Caucus, we will go out and get the expertise that we need uh, to do the project as we've done in the broadband space and the cellular space before. We've gone out and found, found those experts in the field to help us uh, deliver it. That's kind of the secret sauce of, uh, of the way Eorn works is figure out what we need, uh, go and get it and try to bring it in as low a cost as possible. So, but I think those decisions are still uh, need to be made uh, by the wardens, uh, and we'll just see where that uh, where it takes us. But we certainly need additional uh, expertise, uh, I would say. And Jason uh, is on uh, the call too, as Lisa as well. They may want to add to that. But okay, thank you. And my next question, it may be a little early in the program then as well. Um, you were mentioning the uh, distribution where uh, like notional or uh, yeah. allocation. And um, so is it anticipated that there would be a study or something or will it be um, gleaned from the rural housing information system once it's all been inputted for actual allocation throughout the regions? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, notionally, the, the, in the presentation, as I said, took a very simple approach in terms of trying to, just to show, to try and illustrate how it might look. We will need to do a very deep dive into how uh, uh, the allocations are made. And we did that in our, our broadband and our cellular projects. We took a fair bit of time to study what is the fairest and best way uh, to allocate both units and, and terms in the investment as well. So that's to come, counselor, but it's a really fair question. Uh, and so there'll uh, be a lot of staff work that'll have to get done before, uh, you know, we present options to the warden's caucus uh, to, who will ultimately make a, a final decision, but we'll go through a very rigorous process to get there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Wise, are you scratching your head? Are you thinking? Or <laughs> well, I'm I'm at information overload stage at this point, uh, Henry. Yeah. But I, I think I my my half formed uh, thought was more a comment that I, I'm really pleased to see this initiative. Uh, it's ambitious, but not overly ambitious. So um, I just hope it's successful. I I'm really pleased to see it. Thank you. How would you like to see us proceed from here? Mr. Pine, what would you? Um, I believe, uh, Your Honor, that there is a, a, a resolution. Maybe it's not in front of you today. I don't know. But there is a, a resolution that we, uh, we provided, I think, to all the member municipalities in the EOWC group, Meredith, that um, hopefully the counties would see fit to pass. It's a tangible way of showing your support for, for okay. the effort. Orchard, you yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, just to let Council know, we were waiting for this meeting to take place so that you could have the background information before we put that motion in front of you. So that'll be on your July agenda. Oh, okay. It's not on for tonight. It, then. it is included on tonight's agenda. But I... It may be just for information. That's it's for fine. information. The debate will take place on the July meeting. Okay, so right now I need a motion to receive all of this information. Councillor Calver, second by Deputy Warden Wise. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All, always a pleasure. And uh, as Mayor Dustin has mentioned, reach out to us for for questions about this and, and the things that were discussed tonight and any other issues that uh, concern your community. So thank you very much and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Hey, bylaws, confirmation of proceedings in three readings. Dr. Fritz, Dr. Richardson, all in favor? Carried. Motion to adjourn. 
Councillor Wise, Councillor Calvert, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much.